Hello, everybody. My name is Jasmine Murphy. You can call me Sunny. I'm with the Wolf Conservation Center, and I'm here today to talk about the natural history and extirpation of the red wolf in Alabama. So we're going to start by talking about the socio-ecological system, um, the then go into the anthropogenic elements of the socio-ecological system in uh, Alabama during the time of colonial um, and antebellum period, and then move into why uh, one of those worldviews uh, were institutionalized over others, the SES and modernity, and where to go from here. So the socio-ecological system I've kind of mapped out in this way, where we can see the anthropogenic subsystem and the non-anthropogenic subsystem are the primary elements that comprise the entire socio-ecological system. And then the cosmology or your worldview of a particular people um, dictates how and the extent to which those two systems overlap. So this one in particular is reflecting the paradigm that says there is a civilization versus wilderness, the European American worldview. Um, well, more generally the European worldview. Um, and those two subsystems uh, interact with each other and have elements within them that interact as well. And note that none of what I'm none of what I'm saying today is absolute. There are variations within these communities and within these um, groups. So just keep that in mind as well. These are just large um, generalizations um, of, of the most common uh, worldviews. So according to Murray Bookchin, when talking about social ecology philosophy, uh, Bookchin tells us that conventional reason tells us that history is just basically a series of fixed, discrete moments, um, discrete slices of time uh, that will that can be broken down into their individual elements and not necessarily looked at in terms of a greater uh, process of development. And so Bookchin says that we should connect these things, not only in a sense that we see them as a full succession um, or a full um, process uh, or just a holistic time, but also that each one of these moments and the moments in between are defined by development, defined by fluctuation. Bookchin says that being is the process of becoming. Everything is constantly developing to fulfill a given potentiality. And that forms, as you can see here on the left, something that's called our dialectical actuality. It is It is the overall, the holistic view of time as a continuum rather than just a series of discrete moments. And each of those um, cycles that we're seeing here in that uh, spiral in the middle, um, has its own individual cycle that carries with it into the next, the emergent uh, moment that uh, follows it. And that can be in a linear sense, that can be in a cyclical sense. It carries the contradictions, the traits, the characteristics, um, the biases from that previous cycle distilled to uh, inform that next moment. And we can see here, uh, when we expand one of those individual cycles into the socio-ecological system, we can see kind of the mechanisms by which um, anthropogenic and the non-anthropogenic systems um, interact and, and, and kind of work, how they drive. So here in the anthropogenic subsystems, we're looking at the social and moral capital, which dictates our social relationships, um, how we interact with each other, and that gives rise to economic and I would add political capital as well. Let me just move my camera here, my screen, um, and which for, which dictates who has the power and how that power is exercised and gives birth to technology. Um, and, and that dictates how we, you know, go through land use, how we um, interact with the non-anthropogenic environment. And that being said, leads us into the non-anthropogenic environment and how it behaves and how it responds to our interaction. And that continues to feed into the cycle and ultimately feed into back into our empirical reality, which is the immediate present moment that we currently occupy. So all of that being set up, uh, we can now look at Alabama. So when we look at this map of Alabama, we can see that the vast majority of the recent sightings of red wolves in Alabama between 1900 and 1950 were north of the Black Belt. The Black Belt, a lot of people refer to these days as just... Um, this uh oh it's it's defined because of the dark rich soil but rather it was defined at that time because of the high concentration of african slaves in the region which means that was the high concentration of plantations uh which was characterized by vast land clearing 
high intensity commercial agriculture um, and property rights, the property protection against wilderness and all of those different types of things. Um, and so you can start to kind of realize what were the anthropogenic implications that would probably result in a distribution like this of the wolves. And interestingly, the uh, remaining, the, the last wolf sightings that occurred in the Black Belt occurred in the last remaining indigenous territory, which is even more interesting. So we look at this and we ask why. Well, we can look at the different anthropogenic uh, paradigms that were in the region at the time. And so we can see that um, this first fact comes from the Bureau of Ethnology, which is why I want to check it here with uh, testimony from actual indigenous people. Um, so we're looking specifically at Cherokee here. So origin stories such as those featuring Kanati and Selu, the first people, really painted the wolf as the compatriot, a hunting partner, living in a mutually beneficial lifestyle. Um, based on an interview I did, um, a traditional Cherokee belief is that wolf should never be killed except for times in great peril. Um, and then in this video um, titled, uh, you can see the title in the bottom left here, uh, the Cherokee people talk about the red wolf as the red grandfather. So you can see that the wolf is this sacred being in um, traditional Cherokee culture. And we also looked at the Muskogee as, as well, which held um, similar levels of like sacred um, belief and also different uses of, um, you know, wolf skins as a dormant and things like that. So it was widely varied. So then we look at the African-Americans and the red wolf. And you can see the use of this kinship title, which is extremely important because kinship titles are used as relational. They're used as affectionate. They're terms of endearment. So we called brother well, we called the wolf brother, um, but more accurately, brer, brer wolf. Uh, you might also see ba wolf. Um, brer wolf was really foolish. He was clumsy. Uh, he was regularly harassed and bested by brer rabbit if he wasn't already harassing brer rabbit to begin with and often trying to get brer fox involved in his shenanigans. And in the Uncle Remus tales, Uncle Remus actually says repeatedly that you really don't even have to worry about Brer Wolf, because he's such a fool. He's so clumsy. He never, almost never accomplishes his goal. So don't even worry about him. Um, don't be stressed is basically what he would, uh, he would say often. And then we can see how the European Americans came to know the Red Wolf. Uh, we see different names throughout time. So Lupus Niger, uh, the common Red Wolf, the Red Texan Wolf, referring to those in Central and Eastern Texas, and then the Florida variant, um, CL Ater. And then Canis Rufus came in 1905 and was uh, officialized in 1937 and 1957 again. Um, but it went further than that. European-American conceptions of the wolf uh, were very extremely, extremely negative in Alabama, colonial antebellum Alabama. You can see the language here of saying the wolves infest certain areas of the county uh, as if they don't belong there. They're a pest. They're unwanted. They shouldn't be here. Um, and you can see a reference here and here uh, to hunting parties being organized to eliminate the wolves in the county, um, the celebratory tone of killing wolves. Uh, you can see in this one, it refers to wolves as wild beasts that had been terrorizing people. And then there were also parallels in the way that European Americans perceived wolves and indigenous people. Um, in this instance, they were talking about forcing uh, indigenous people to leave the area rather than uh, which would be more preferable than hunting them down like deer, wild deer and wolves. And there's a lot more, uh, a lot worse <laughs> examples, particularly from the West, uh, Western settler uh, culture. Um, and then there, that also extended to Africans as well. In this particular example, we see European Americans comparing um, the African uh, to the Caucasian parallel to the wolf and the dog, the wolf being the more savage, barbarous uh, version of the domestic civilized dog. Um, and then that translated further into uh, national policy. So th those European American perceptions were institutionalized via the Bureau of Biological Survey. So we can see that in this language here, it's necessary to eliminate them. Um, the possibilities of their actual extermination undoubtedly lies many centuries in the future. So even though they recognized that it was not practical to wipe out wolves uh, across the country, 
um, they were going to try anyway. And it's important to note that they are talking on a national scale, but the Bureau of Biological Survey did contract hunters and have offices in Alabama. And so we can see how this worldview was institutionalized. Um, so as you can see, we've got A, B, and C here as it correlates to the socio-ecological system in flux over on the right. So A, we have the uh, Adam Onis Treaty that led to Alabama statehood, which led to the bounty law being enacted, then citizens killing wolves in excess, back up to A, Indian Removal Act, um, then land acquisitions accelerate, C, colonists move west, clearing lands, shifting dominant social paradigm in the region, and then A, Bureau of Biological Survey established, B, leads to formal installation of offices, and C, further formalization of the relationships between um, government agencies and citizens wanting to kill wolves. So this continues in modern day with uh, biases against wolves, um, which I'll talk about in B, but indigenous North American and African American lifeways and worldviews are continued to uh, are continually othered um, in a sense that, uh, for example, our our traditional stories and our orations are just relegated to like anecdote or those are just myths, but not really explored for their scientific value. And then you have the prioritization of livestock and property over native wildlife and their intrinsic value and persistent anthropogenic mortality in the only place where wild red wolves exist in the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, particularly in the form of shooting deaths, which are the um, are the most severe and common form of red wolf deaths that continue to be unaddressed. Um, and so that's why we say stakeholder theory doesn't work. Uh, what it actually does is it propagates um, contradictions and problems and traits from previous developmental cycles um, that continue to be perpetuated in this um dialectical actuality here. And we can see that that what's propagated particularly is European knowledge systems, paradigms, and values through those different empirical realities. Um, and that's how all of these things are connected. And I want to mention as well that stakeholder theory is not a democratic theory. It is a business theory, and it has been applied to what should be democratic systems. Um, primarily also because it propagates, like I said, it propagates uh, your supremacy in terms of these things that I have here on the y-axis, and it fixates on the need for there to be a non-stakeholder, um, which is absolutely not democratic at all. Um, and it also continues to other knowledge systems and life ways because what it functions to do is when you talk about stakeholder engagement, let's say, what you're doing in practice is looking for input from communities that are typically othered and marginalized. And you're looking to incorporate their input into a pre-existing system and into a plan or planned action that is already predetermined, at least in terms of its goals and often in terms of its mechanisms, and just looking to filter that input in a way that slightly appeases those who you might consider stakeholders, but still ultimately achieves the predetermined goals of that system. And so that is not democratic whatsoever um, because it does not actually work for the people and it also invisibilizes those who have little power to affect whatever plan. Um, and so that's why we say that it should be de-emphasized and rather social ecology uh, further emphasize in order to actually engage with the elements, the agents in that anthropogenic system who are all constituents of these democratic agencies. Um, and just as a final example, um, I would I would say that ideological homogeneity is equal to or worse than superficial diversity. And again, I just want to re-emphasize and kind of explain that a little bit more. Um, when you're looking to engage with quote unquote stakeholders, you're really looking to kind of filter through their input in order to incorporate it into a pre-existing system rather than changing the system itself. And that comes with a lot of presumptions on who your stakeholders are 
and invisibilizes those who should be considered stakeholders, those with low power. And then when you might be considering uh, communities like those I come from, uh, there are presumptions like, oh, the, we have to teach the urban people how to enjoy and how to love nature. Uh, whereas, you know, we're already out here having relationships with nature as it is. Like I said, we need to de-emphasize stakeholder theory uh, and lift up social ecological theory. And so I thank you for listening. And I would also recommend that you email me for the link to this map here. Our colleague Amy Shutt did an incredible job uh, putting together all the last sightings of the red wolf in Alabama. And as you click on these locations, you'll see the individual news clippings that correlate to those sightings. So I thank you for listening.